let's dive into the first one of those tests, the pseudomotor axon reflex test. In order to understand that test, you, um, you should really go to its basis, which is the multi-compartmental sweat cell. This is basically a capsule that has two separated components to it. An outer compartment that is being filled with acetylcholine, and then ionophorized into the skin, where a sweat response is being induced. But we are not interested in the sweat response right under that outer rim, which is a direct sweat response. We are simply stimulating sweat glands. What we're really interested in is the response in the center compartment of that capsule, because that's uh, separated from the outer rim and requires uh, another form of stimulation to occur in order to see a response, and that's an axon reflex. So we're basically stimulating a peripheral axon that then travels a distance to a different set of sweat glands where it induces a sweat response. And that sweat response requires that the postganglion sympathetic fiber is intact, and that's where the axon reflex test is coming from and uh, is superior to a direct stimulation of the sweat gland. We record that um, response at four standardized sites, one at the forearm, one at the distal leg, one at the proximal leg, and one at the foot. And we'll demonstrate all that here in a little while. Here an example of a normal sweat response on the left, where there's rather homogeneous responses at all four sites. And on the right, an example of a patient with distal small fiber neuropathy and a virtually absent response in the foot. Here on top, again, a normal example. And on the bottom, a patient with a severe form of autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy who has absent responses at all four sites. Now, if someone comes in on 200 milligrams of amitriptyline, the response could look just like that. So that's something to always keep in mind. Um, it is not always pathology that results in abnormal tests. Now, brief word about Q-sweat. You may have heard that and now wonder what's Q-sart, what's Q-sweat. Really, Q-sweat is the commercial version of Q-sart. It is still a Q-sart, just has its own brand name. Um, there are a few differences from the original Mayo pseudorometer, uh, certain sensors and the, the type of gas used, etc., to, to the desiccant and, and so on. There's a few differences, but overall, the, the principle is the same. And uh, what we found out, to our big surprise, is that Q sweat responses tend to be smaller than Q SART responses. And we have, David, still not figured out why that is. Uh, in spite of extensive uh, search. We've also f tried to find conversion factors that allow us to convert one response to the other. That didn't seem to work out. So we decided we need normative data specifically for Q-sweat, and we derived those. Now, um, as I mentioned before, there's factors other than disease that can affect an abnormal sweat response. And um, I mentioned the medications already, so this is always something to keep in mind. Um, age and gender clearly play a role, and uh, then, of course, autonomic disease. Uh, gender plays a big role in pseudomotor responses. Uh, responses from women are, uh, on average, markedly lower than the responses we get from men. Um, age is not as big of a factor. There's a wide age range between 15 and 75 where there's really no significant change occurring. It's just a very young and the very old where there's a drop-off. Um, then uh, on the right here, I'm showing you a little example of a recent study we did um, on subjects where there was a spuriously absent response. Those were otherwise healthy people. We wouldn't expect an absent response at the forearm. And uh, we intensified our skin preparation, and uh, voila, they all had a normal response. So skin preparation is really important. Uh, and we'll demonstrate that again in, in, in some detail here, uh, how to obtain a, a good response with the right skin preparation.